Rain fell in sheets on the quadrangle of Beaufort College that night, the 1st of August. It formed pools on the stone-flagged courtyard and drenched the late roses. From the windows of the master's lodge could be heard music mingled with male voices, including that of the master himself, Matthew Copley Barnes. Howdy, oh, Rain. At least it's clean, Rain, master. As far as we know. The master emerged with one of the fellows of the college, Dr. Julian Deere, and they hurried across the quad under one umbrella. When they reached the cloister, Barnes stopped suddenly. Damn it. I read my papers at the lodge. I'll catch you up. Do you want this? I know if I As the master retraced his steps, Deere carried on through the rain, passing a poster announcing a debate on the motion this house believes that environmental issues transcend party politics. In another part of Oxford, two men came round a corner under the flashing neon sign of a snooker hall. Why do I have to come out on a night like this? You heard your instructions. I told you I won't do it. I think you're going to have to. George Parsons pushed the slightly built young man roughly against a car, opened the door and bundled him inside. They drove through the centre of Oxford and stopped in a side street bounded by a high wall. The young man got out, scaled the wall, and disappeared over the other side. Copley Barnes, meanwhile, came back into the drawing room of the lodge. His wife Blanche looked up from her playing, surprised. I forgot something. Damn nuisance, too much on my plate. Well, carry on. He left again at the same time as Julian Deere came out of his rooms with an umbrella. Deere set off across the grounds, and Copley Barnes hurried after him, clutching his papers to his chest. It was very dark, and both men were walking quickly. Julian Deere skirted the famous beds of roses that graced the grounds of Beaufort College when a figure stepped out of the shadows behind the college wall and struck him savagely on the back of the head. Crossing the courtyard a few moments later, Copley Barnes stopped abruptly at the sight of his colleague lying in the rain with the young man in the leather jacket crouching over him. The young man darted towards him and shoved the master backwards into the wall. Copley Barnes slumped into a heap, unconscious, as the young man ran off into the night. Morse, his overcoat collar turned up to keep the rain out, struggled against the tide of people with umbrellas who were streaming out of the Oxford Union. The debate had obviously finished. What's happened? They're counting the votes! Did Julian Deere speak? He nearly showed up! Morse stopped and pushed back the wet hair on his forehead, wondering what to do now. In a small bedroom cluttered with posters and tapes, Mick McGovern, the young man in the leather jacket, wretched into a basin. <coughs> he looked up into the mirror and wiped the vomit away with the back of his hand. To his horror, it left a smear of blood round his mouth. Sometime later, Morse was back on duty. He and Lewis went to visit the master of Beaufort College. They found him lying on his drawing room sofa, recuperating from his attack. Curious state of affairs, concussion. My doctor tells me that tomorrow I should expect my legs to walk in different directions. You must forgive me if my account is a little hazy. This is your umbrella, sir. I imagine, sir. You imagine, sir? Was Dr. Deers identical? Would you expect my, that is, the master's umbrella to display some differentiating feature? from that of a senior fellows. Perhaps you have some general interest in the taxonomy of umbrellas, Chief Inspector. Taxonomy? Sounds like stuffing something. Stuffed umbrellas? No, Lewis. Taxonomy is classification. The master was making a joke. We only found one umbrella, sir. I just want a clear picture of what happened. Of course. Forgive me, I'm babbling. Blame the 
bump. Blanche, one moment, would you? Coming, darling. At least I can babble. Which is more than poor Julian can do. Oughtn't we to try the hospital again? His heart. We'll be notified of any change. No more details come to mind yet, sir. We could use a better description of the attacker. What well, with the rain and the dark? I had an impression of wild eyes. Made me think of the young Wittgenstein. If that means anything to you. Before or after his Norwegian period. I was hoping to hear the debate myself. I was looking forward to Dr. Deer's contribution. A uh, very great man. He's so rarely tempted to speak. Such a pity. Is that my umbrella? His wife took the umbrella from Morse. Well, I, I should know. I, I donned it myself near the fastening in 1983. Rather a dying art. Darning, wouldn't you say? And thrift is such an unfashionable virtue. Definitely, Matthews. Huh, do we make the proverbial noises now? I'm sorry. Well, aren't we supposed to say, would you like a drink, so you can say, not while I'm on duty, then I provide tea instead? Tea, you go down. We nice don't have time, I'm afraid. It looks as if you disturbed an attempted mugging tonight, sir. I suppose an arrest, let alone an early arrest, would be too much to hope for. I'll keep you informed of any developments, but there's so little to go on. And such serious undermining of the police force, I know. I sit on the appropriate government committee. Still, I'm sure you'll do your best. Who is your chief superintendent? Mr. Rennie on this case, in the absence of Chief Superintendent Strange. Good night, Chief Inspector. Sergeant Curious. Oh, I ought to tell you, we're expecting a guest tomorrow for a family party, you see. I'd be grateful if you bear that in mind when you're planning your inquiries. I'll do my best. What? Oh, yes, thank you. Many thanks. It's certainly Matthews. She took the umbrella and went to answer the phone. Master's Lodge? You just caught him. It's for you, Chief Inspector. Thanks. Yes, I'll get back on it. Copley Barnes turned round at the top of the stairs. Bad news? Quite complicates things a bit, sir. Got a death in it now. Next day, a small crowd of students gathered to watch the forensic officers at work in the taped-off area of Beaufort Quad. In the street outside, a very smartly dressed young woman in dark glasses got out of a minicab and followed Lewis through the archway as he joined Morse inside. College Porter thinks now he saw a youngish fella come dashing out this end. Right sort of time. Description? Vague. But he says he'd know him again. A pool of vomit just around that corner. Felt it by the wall, so the rain didn't wash it away. There were at a fellows meeting, it ran late. They were in a hurry. They were going to take Beaufort Path. The master turned back at the archway to collect some papers from home. We've got a pool of vomit and a lost umbrella, Mr. Gray. Mean anything to you? Vomit? What's new around here? That bloke you mentioned. You didn't happen to notice him puke first, did he? That corner? No, he was on the move when I saw him. A student? Not one of ours. Been no umbrella handed in either. You gonna get who did for him? Don't know. He was done for yet. We're waiting for the post mortem. Even if his heart gave out, he was still done for. It makes a difference, though, Mr. Gray. The charge, the sentence. It's murder to me and everyone else at Beaufort. Well, let's just see if you can't sharpen up the description you gave, Sergeant Lewis. The porter looked sheepish. As Lewis began to question him, Mick McGovern walked unnoticed into the college. In the senior common room, Jake Normington had assembled the college choir. Thank you for coming. Such short notice. I thought some practice was necessary. Before the funeral. Right. Open the windows, will you? All of them. And the door. Bard's 
miserere. Let us sing out our sorrow. Let us be heard by everyone in college. At the master's lodge, the housekeeper opened the door to the smartly dressed young woman from the minicab. As she stepped inside, she took off her sunglasses and looked around. She walked over to the open door of the drawing room where Blanche Copley Barnes was standing at a piano, teaching a young boy. Hello. Yes? The young woman moved into the light. Oh, my dear, you're early, but how perfectly wonderful. I, I have a pupil, you see. Please. It's all right, Blanche. We'll hug later. Go back to her. Very well. It's him, actually. <laughs> Blanche returned to the lesson, and Sylvie Maxton wandered into the vast dining room with its rows of leather-bound books surrounding a long, polished table. Morse, meanwhile, was in the cloister, staring at the poster for the previous night's debate, when Lewis came back from gathering statements. Seems to have been some sort of saint, this doctor, dear. Can't get anybody to say a wrong word about him. So blooming modest, I can't even get a profile. He was modest. You knew him, sir? Only by reputation, not personally. Who won the debate? Hmm? This house believes that environmental issues transcend party politics. Carried by a small majority. Dr. Deer would have been pleased. As Morse and Lewis left the shelter of the cloister, McGovern slipped across the cloister and through the doorway to staircase seven, where Dr. Deer's room had been. Refused an entry in who's who. Call it the poser's address book, apparently. <laughs> you read his books, sir? Not all of them. I read the barren planet. I couldn't get through the breath of life. How about this for an environment? Yeah. After themselves, don't they? What about that master's lodge last night? He's not sure. He thought it had been very rich, Beaufort. Very rich, very scientific, very musical. Oh, message. Here we go. This will be the post-mortem report. Morse looked over to the room where the singing was coming from. He felt drawn towards it. Jake Normington looked up from his music to see Morse walk in behind the choir. He nodded his head towards the seat, and Morse tiptoed over and sat down listening. In the master's lodge, Sylvie was looking at an old photograph when Copley Barnes silently appeared in the doorway. She jumped as he spoke. Our visitor. Our distinguished visitor. What does one say? One could say hello, master. Hardly seems appropriate after all this time. It'll do. I suppose master is what I call you. That too will do. Yes. We've grown out of Uncle Matthew, haven't we? A whim of my wife's, as I remember. Like the present occasion. Oh, come now, Master. You make me feel my attentions aren't welcome. Hardly a promising start for an interview. I mean, my wife saw my cooperation as a way of healing any conceivable breach that might have been between you and my family. So, I comply. Why the police here? An unfortunate incident last night. A senior fellow was attacked. Lest your journalistic antennae begin to quiver, the story is, so to speak, old news. The local press have scooped you. Drink. Hello, Sylvie. I'm sorry? It's Imogen, Sylvie. Of course it is. I'm sorry. 
17 years is a long time. Well, for me, it seems, but not for you. <laughs> Nonsense. It's called a clothing allowance. <laughs> How are you? Oh, ticking over, you know. This is Ron, my husband. Oh, that's something I haven't acquired along the way. Nice to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Oh. Good. Helped keep the last decent Sunday in business. And I want to hear about your business. What is it? Horses? Stables. Uh, yes. Off the Newbury Road. It's nothing glamorous. We're just starting. So, yeah. Blanche came through the drawing room door, and they walked towards each other to embrace. I'm so very, very glad you came back to us. After the rehearsal, the choir filed out, and Normington and Moore shook hands. Thanks, Jack. That was a bonus in my working day. I didn't know you were back from America. Ah, I have this arrangement now. I spend uh, one term a year at Beaufort, the rest at Princeton. A better class of mathematics at Princeton? A better class of money. And how about the chorus singing? Ah, now, there's nothing quite like that pure, clear English sound, is there? Not the way you produce it. We must have a drink sometime. Yes, well, I still do the Renaissance group when I'm here. We've missed you recent years, you and your useful baritone. Well, the Renaissance group's too demanding for me now. There's the job. It's the long hours. This, um, Julian's death would... Will this mean long hours? I shouldn't think so. We just got the post-mortem result. We're winding it up. Really? Dr. Deer died of a heart attack. Is that official? It's what's on the death certificate. The mugging was incidental. He'd have died anyway. Three, six months. Was he a particular friend of yours? I loved him. You know, we weren't lovers. So that wasn't his style. Lots of people loved, loved him. He inspired them. Let's just say he was an inspiration in my life, anyway. I'm sorry. This debate, he got something to say, something new, disturbing. Any idea what? Uh, he, he'd written to me about it in America. There were hints. He talked about feeling obliged to sound off in public, hoping I'd be there. Were you? Yes. Yes, by the skin of my teeth, just off the train, I made it. Sudden death. That's hard to take. People tend to look for reasons. Do that. It's the intellectual muggers you have to watch for around here, Morse. They're the ones who wouldn't have wanted him to speak. You wouldn't care to elaborate, would you? You know where to contact me. Yes. Yes. Morse left his old friend alone in the room. Moments later, the door swung open again, and McGovern slipped inside. There was something furtive about the way he glanced back through the door before turning to face Normington. He looked scared. At lunchtime, Morse and Lewis met up in a local pub. Mugging goes with drugs, often as not. If it was mugging. Yeah. Didn't ring any bells with the drugs, boys. Oh, it's not the place for it. You haven't been busy? It's got a bit of intrigue about it, this, isn't it? A pool of vomit now. It wasn't your usual spewed up undergraduate rubbish. Lewis. Hmm? Oh, sorry, sir. Forget your stomach. Oh, it's pastry, spinach, and cheese, mostly. Two kinds of cheese, as a matter of fact. Didn't have to poke about it, then, did you? No, no. I got a sample sent over to the lab. While you went to hear that choir. Now you tell me. Brie and dolce latte. Wholemeal pastry. Sort of a, what is it? Quiche, probably. How many people knew he had a bad heart? What deliberate, you mean? What's the motive? Someone wanted to stop him speaking at the debate. What was he going to say? Well, it 
would help if we found out, wouldn't it, Lewis? Let's go. Are we sticking with it, that's it? I'll have to convince Superintendent Manny he thinks it's finished. Then he should say so, shouldn't he? Categorically. Till it does, we've got a bit of time. What makes you think undergraduates don't go in for speciality kitsch, Lewis? It's not on the college menu. Oh, that vomits it. That was real ale in it, too. Later, Lewis got Mr. Gray, the porter, to show him round Dr. Deer's study in college. Some of your fellows already took a look, Sergeant. Yeah, well, I'm just doing a recheck. Got the cell, this, isn't it? Well, he was a real scholar, wasn't he? What did he do with his earnings? Gave it all away, I expect. Who gets all this stuff? The books? College, I suppose. He had no relations. Lewis found a cassette player on the desk, but both it and the cassette rack beside it were empty. In another part of the college, Normington and McGovern were listening to the taped voice of Julian Deere. I am not at ease with this machinery, please bear with me. I resort to these methods because it seems wise to make some record of what I intend to say in the union debate. My contribution will be, to all intents and purposes, a warning, a statement I am forced to make in public. Even though I deplore the necessity and am uncomfortable in that arena, what I have to say has, I believe, the most grave and far-reaching implications. I do not exaggerate. Three of the country's leading newspapers have refused to publish communications on this topic. In the gardens of Beaufort College, Sylvie Maxton was arranging the master's family for a photograph, while the master himself strolled with Morse. She popularizes, I suppose. And then that's her job. I wouldn't call the Sunday Review the most popular newspaper in the world. Ah, you know about these things. Well, I recognize Sylvie Maxton. All Sunday newspapers are anathema to me, Andrew. You are not afraid for your reputation, master. I'm sorry? Sylvie Maxton's stock in trade is the expose, I believe. <laughs> Our interest on this occasion is in the type, simply. The master of an Oxford college. Do you have any idea of what Dr. Deer was intending to say at the debate? No. And he never made notes. His lectures were the same off the cuff. And brilliant, of course, closely argued. Not that he gave many, he preferred seminars. Small groups. So how was he persuaded to speak at the Union debate? It was out of character, surely, the publicity. He may have wished deliberately to engage a wider audience. The subject was an environmental issue, was it not close to his heart? Do you think his statement would have been controversial? <laughs> Who knows? Darling! You were going to attend the debate yourself, sir. May I ask if you'd have been likely to agree with Dr. Deer's views? Since I hadn't heard those particular views expressed, how can I say? You went back for some papers. Were they relevant? They were simply some reflections on the issues involved. No, I'm sorry, I can't be of more help to you, Chief Inspector. What is it I'm to do for this farce? They want you among the delphiniums, darling. <laughs> now he'll decide to look gruesome, and I shan't be able to bear the results. <laughs> Beautiful garden, Mrs. Copley Barnes. Isn't it indeed? Of course, we're outrageously lucky in the fabulous Phil. The fabulous Phil? Phil Hopkirk, our gardener. Well, not ours, of course, the college's. And not theirs for long, because he's been seduced by Q, would you believe? He's staying on to win the College Gardens Cup for Beaufort this year, Touchwood. Do you dibble and hoe, Chief Inspector? I, uh... I can't somehow see myself raising flowers. A perfect lawn, perhaps, that would be a challenge. Actually, I like to think we've given something back to Phil. He's a widower. His daughter's musical. I encourage... did encourage her. She's gone on ahead to London to an aunt, so her schooling's not interrupted. Oh, what's this now, would you say? Second post, Mrs. Copley Bond. 
Thank you, Greg. I'll take it. What is it, Blanche? Uh, parcel master. Need to sign in for. Hand parcel. Matthew. I think it's another one. Don't accept it. Send it back now. Please don't accept it. Be calm, Blanche. I must accept it. Oh, thank you, Greg. This is not the first of these outrages, these insults, Inspector. Well, one knows there are unbalanced people. One hears, but one never really believes. Is it a police matter? I don't think there's any cause for alarm. What is it, Father? It's all right. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, yes, it is. I do fear it is. I wish I could say otherwise, but I am afraid we have to prepare ourselves. Send us address, 15 Beat Street, Highbury. False, false, like the others. The last one, Chief Inspector. Oh, for heaven's sake, control yourself. It's a hoax. Someone playing tricks, that's all. There's no name. Will the others anonymous? What's going on? You might well ask, Sylvia. There's no answer. No conceivable explanation we can find. Nothing we could physically understand. Out of the layers of sucking, the master lifted a sheep's skull with long curling horns. The same day, Parsons stepped into a phone box somewhere in Oxford. He sucked on a cigarette as he listened to the ringing tone. In the cluttered little bedroom with the Greenpeace posters, but in the police station, Morse was talking to Chief Superintendent Rennie. The master of Beaufort gets hate mail, parcels, uh, nothing dangerous, just uh, distressing. And you're saying that there is some connection with the attack on Dr. Deer? I'm saying I'd like to investigate further. A mugging like that, unpremeditated probably, hit or miss stuff. What are the chances, Morse, of nailing someone? Not high, sir, in the ordinary course of things, I agree. You see, what I want to avoid is you turning over a lot of stones just to see what's underneath. So, we all know your methods, Morse, and I'll grant you they've been effective sometimes. The master of Beaufort, Copley Barnes, is on a police force policy committee. Did you know that? Yes, I did know that, sir. And um, he reminded me. Where's your evidence for this connection? I'm about to compile it, sir. So. Have you ever been to Austria? Only to Salzburg, sir. So, for the festival. Oh. What kind of festival is that? Morse looked dismissively at the chief superintendent. Downstairs in the outer office, Lewis was on the telephone. So there's nothing really for us to get excited about, is there not? You better give us the gory details anyway. Yeah. yeah. I could. I'm not pretty sure we've gone in for a bit yet. Ah, not that long actually. No, it could be just three days. Okay, thanks. Ta da! Sheep's blood on the skull. Well, lamb's blood, as a matter of fact. Squeezed from the Sunday joint, maybe. At least when he gave us a bit of leeway. Only till the ranks closed, Lewis. They went directly back to the college to speak to Blanche Copley Barnes again. Terrible. Two parcels, you said, before this one. Yes, two D sharp, Lawrence, if you please. They came through the post from London sorting offices. Different offices. This first one was registered in Holman. They came from Islington, I believe, and uh, Camden. Matthew would remember. I'm so sorry you missed him. He. He had to go out. The snake skin came from Camden. Snake skin? The dried skin of an ander. Shriveled. I went quite dippy for a moment when I saw it. Matthew was remarkably steady. Though even he, I mean the second one. Well, the smell was around for days, the sitting room. I had to see my pupils in their own homes, which is never satisfactory because the instruments are always inferior. 
the uh, smell, Mrs. Copley Barnes. Fish. Stinking fish. A plastic pail, would you believe? Packed with shellfish, seaweed, the sort of things you'd scoop out of a rock pool, very carefully sealed, and then... And it was opened. We're dealing with a fanatic here. Someone with an axe to grind. Oh, no. No, no, Matthew said it was almost certainly a disaffected student. A failure, perhaps. Even a failed first, they're the most bitter of all, as a rule. <laughs> your pupil's doing very well. Oh, you're musical, Chief Inspector. Rather than horticultural. I listen. I know your reputation as a teacher. Really? You think it's fearfully exclusive? I am very choosy, I suppose, but then I don't care to waste my time on anything less than real potential. I bought my nippers one of them electronic keyboards. Mrs. Copley Barnes looked at him with utter horror. Parcels of... what? Uh, natural products? Why? My husband thinks they might relate to specific examination questions. They could as easily relate to the motion of the Union the other night. Well, you don't imagine that they might have something to do with what happened to Julian. It's a possible line of inquiry. You will uh, keep us informed. Of course. Oh, um... Your son-in-law, Mr. Garrett? Ronald. What about him? He seemed concerned yesterday to play down the significance of these things. Oh, for my daughter's benefit, I expect. That's his way. Protective. She's very highly strung. Have they been married long? Oh, it's four or five years. He's very much Imogen's choice. Uh, by that, I mean that we, Matthew and I, Thank we... You. I'll be in touch. As Morse and Lois were leaving the lodge, Sylvia Maxton drove into the stable yard where Ron Garrett was at work. He was clutching a bunch of flowers. From an upstairs window, Imogen watched, twisting the telephone cord in her hands as Sylvia went up to her husband. Morning! Hi. Where's Imogen? Inside. Did she say he was coming? I'm going to pretend to interview her. We'll talk about old times instead. She doesn't want to see you. I'm sorry? She's not well. She says to apologize. It was at the past school yesterday. What did you make of it? So we've got a grudge against him, I suppose. Not surprising. He offends a lot of people. Give her these, will you? They're from the garden. Good to see the fabulous film. And carried hither by the commendable Sylvia. Is that their name for you? Who is Sylvia? What is she that all us swains commend her? Um, the reliable Rom, I believe. <laughs> and are you? I was never very commendable. <laughs> Must be hard work here. Yeah? We like it. Couldn't take a horse out, could I? Do you ride? I learned with Imogen when we were ten. You could come with me. Fill me in on a few things. Go on. As they walked into the stables, Imogen picked up the phone and dialed. Imogen laid the receiver on the desk in front of her. Imogen, is that you? Is it you, darling? Imogen? Please, darling, don't do this again. In the sunshine, Ron and Sylvie galloped up the hillside behind the stables. Sylvie rode well, confident on horseback. At the top, Ron pulled up his horse and they turned to look out over the valley. He's come here for picnics once. He's always taken up by the Coopley Barneses. Before my father died. Well, they didn't have picnics, did they? <laughs> no. They had expeditions to centres of cultural interest. <laughs> Does Imogen talk about the old times? Not much. What happened to her? What do you mean, what happened? Well, she's different. She used to be... Oh, different. Energetic, funny. I couldn't keep up. I went to London. She stayed on in Oxford. She didn't get her degree, did she? No. She had a breakdown. As I'm sure you know from your research. 
How did her parents react to that? Overjoyed. But I can't spare the time for this. Walk on. I'm sorry, but she was important to me growing up. They widened my horizons. The whole family did. It matters if she's not happy. You happy? Well, I haven't broken down. I don't react to shock the way she does. I'll need to look after her now. Well, she's lucky. I'm lucky. As the parents never tire of pointing out. You ever wanted to give marriage a go? Couldn't stay the course. It? I'm fine as I am. We want kids. Someday. It's all going in your piece. What do you think I am? I don't know. I only know the kind of thing you write. Walk on. Garrett spurred his horse into a canter, and Sylvie had no choice but to follow. They rode back to the stables and dismounted without talking again. As Garrett took the saddle off his mount, Sylvie took off her riding hat and shook out her hair, moving towards the door of the house. Here you are. I just want to wash my hands. There's a sink in the tack room. She doesn't want to see you. I just want to say goodbye. Why can't you leave her alone? She was my friend, for God's sake. You don't know how... She opened the door to see the silhouetted figure of Copley Barnes towering above her on the stairs. If I'd known in time, we might have come together. Have you come to see Imogen? There's been a small emergency. She telephoned. All's well now. I should confer briefly with my son-in-law. Since you're back. I want to see her. It's impossible, I'm afraid. I think we should both be on our way. Now, if you left. I have a hired car. Thank you. She tore her arm away from Copley Barnes's grip and marched past Garrett on her way out. Tell Blanche she won't be home for dinner. Morse and Lewis, meanwhile, were on their way back to the police station. Was she famous then, Mrs. Seavey? Yeah, she was quite a performer in her day. Not world class, but decent third uh, program. Never made it to the top. Maybe she lacked concentration. Uh, she doesn't seem all there somehow. The master's absent-minded wife. Takes years to cultivate that for us. An essential requirement for the job. <laughs> They could be connected. These parcels could be tattooed up it. Why not? What have we got, Lewis? A scientific philosopher, Dr. Julian Clear, virtual recluse, keen on environmental issues, anxious to speak in a university debate. Strain on the nerves, that. It is heart trouble. Right, so doing it must matter to him, but no notes, no record of what he was going to say. And then we have a distinguished chemist, the master, Copley Barnes, who's being pestered by a postal faddist who's trying to tell him something about death and decay. Two sorts of attack. It's on the same theme, I think Rennie will go for that. Shouldn't think so. Maybe put it on tape. Well. If he wanted to make a record of what he was going to say, he might have spoken it onto a tape. There was a recorder in his rooms. All his tapes were missing. Yeah. So maybe someone knows what he's going to say. You've just earned yourself a drink, Lewis. Oh, it's lentil soup in the canteen today. It's too warm for lentil soup. As Morse and Lewis headed back to the car, Jake Normington turned his Morris into the entrance of Park Town Hospital. He didn't notice the car parked on curb. Even if he had, he wouldn't have recognized the man at the wheel. It was George Parsons. Normington stopped in the visitor's car park. Hey. McGovern got up from where he'd been lying on the back seat and climbed out. Thanks. Normington waited by the car while McGovern went in. In a quiet ward, a middle-aged woman lay in bed. Her face was gaunt and greyish and she shielded her eyes with her hand. Mum? The hand slowly moved away, and she looked up from her pillow and smiled fondly at her son, but seemed too weak to move. He 
bent down and kissed her on the cheek and sat down beside the bed. That's better. Mawson Lewis, meanwhile, had gone back to Dr. Deer's room and found the cassette rack was now full. Someone had put them back. Morse decided it was time to pay another visit to Jake Normington. Still on the trail, eh, Morse? Why have you come to sign up with the Renaissance Group after all? Still on the trail, Jake. Well, I've just been going through Dr. Deer's things again. Oh, anything I can do to help? You can tell me who might have had a key to his rooms. Did you, for instance? Oh, no. <laughs> That's a very big naughty round here, as you may remember from your Oxford days. Did you? No. I think there's something missing from his collection of capes. Is there some other way in, apart from the staircase? Uh, no, no, no. Well, I, I suppose Julian could have lent somebody a key. He was a, he was a true anarchist, after all. Only kept the college rules when they suited his view of the world. No. Morse opened the door to the bedroom to see McGovern sitting on the bed. Well, thank God you're dressed. We wouldn't want to shock the Chief Inspector too much, would we? You can go now. McGovern stared at Morse and left. Oh. <laughs> Very embarrassing. Not to me. I never could resist the charm of casual acquaintance. Speaking as a professional, I tend to sound the standard warning about uh, casual acquaintance these days. Oh, I absorbed all the warnings long ago, but then um, health and efficiency were ever my watchwords. Look, I've got a tutorial in ten minutes. Um, perhaps we should get together for that drink soon. That first morning, you uh, seemed to suggest that all was not well at Beaufort. Something about intellectual mugging. Well, I was upset. What do I know? I'm away two-thirds of the time. Morse decided not to pursue the matter further. He found Lewis outside in the quad. Anything? Nothing. Nobody's saying anything. Everyone's scared. Paul is not saying much either. Hates them off his guts. He's got this college loyalty. He did say the place got a bit richer when Copley Barnes was investment person. Did he? Gave their industrial share holding a big boost in the late 70s. Pulled into Corby International. They fund his research too. Corby. Chemical Organic Range and Biosystems. So know what it stands for, Lewis. Corby was the victim of one of Sylvie Maxton's journalistic inquiries recently, if I'm not mistaken. Take the big thing at the funeral. The garden is on overtime. Did you see a young man leave by this door just now? Nope. Only a couple of girls came out of here while I've been here. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, there's a bloke down at headquarters who remembers her when she lived here, Oxford. Who? Oh. Sylvie Maxton. She's got a bit of form, you know. She what? She's got form. Been quite a naughty girl, actually. Drinking, creating a disturbance, beyond parental control, apparently. She got a year's probation. Inside the college chapel, Morse and Lewis join the mourners assembled for the funeral of Julian Deere. The chapel was crowded, and extravagant displays of flowers made the air heavy with their scent. Sylvie Maxton stood with Imogen and Garrett, staring at the stained glass eve above her, taking a yellow apple from the glass serpent while Phil Hopkirk, the gardener, watched stone-faced as the bearers brought in the coffin and placed it in the aisle. The congregation sat down, and Copley Barnes got up to speak. How can the worldly pay adequate tribute to one whose unworldliness was his most admirable quality? How can those of us whose ideals were compromised early Appropriately praise one whose ideals remained pure and uncontaminated by the values of the outside world. As Copley Barnes spoke, George Parsons broke into an empty house.
He was followed by a second man with a petrol can. They went into the cluttered little bedroom and poured petrol over the bed, the Greenpeace posters, the books, the photograph of the young man with his mother. The job done, the men retreated, throwing a light through the door. Flames engulfed the belongings, and in minutes the house was an inferno. For a long time the photograph did not burn, and the young man and his mother smiled through the flames. Perfect hops for Moving room. The master is up in the seat. That's right. Twisted his arm. Well, Blanche's actually. He's being the prodigal. I can get away with him. For the time being. I see David Naylor's here. Naylor? Head of Corby International. Are you surprised? <laughs> He's hardly a friend of Julian Deere's, would you think? Behind David Naylor, Moore suddenly noticed the young man he had last seen in Jake Normington's bedroom. Excuse me. Morse went towards him through the crowd. McGovern noticed and started to run, heading for one of the college staircases. Please, excuse me. Lewis looked round and, realizing what was happening, joined in the chase. Please, excuse me. McGovern started pushing people aside in his hurry. Then the porter saw McGovern. Out of the way! Just a minute, you! This is the man shooting. I said I'd know you again. Morse arrived to see Gray holding McGovern in an arm lock. The mourners gathered round, craning for a glimpse. Morse bent down to pick up a couple of women's magazines that McGovern had dropped and, straightening up, saw Normington looking through the crowd, concern in his eyes, before he slipped away out of the college. Back in his rooms, Normington was hurriedly packing his bags. He emptied his drawers of clothes, packed his books, and pulled open a cupboard. Inside was the cassette of Julian Deere's speech. He took it out, hid it in a sock, and put it in his suitcase. That night at police headquarters, Morse paced around the interview room. McGovern sat at a table under a hanging lamp, avoiding Morse's eye. What have you got again? Time? Because it is only a matter of time, you know. And you'll regret wasting it with me. This is your usual reading matter, woman. Woman's world. You probably gathered Jake Normington is a friend of mine. He'll be brought in to identify you, or at least tell us what he knows where he met you, where there is someone who'll give you a name. How many cruising dons have picked you up off the street? It wouldn't be difficult to bring in one or two of the old familiar importunists. Less discreet than Normington. Yes, Lewis. Have you got a minute? Morse followed him into the corridor where Lewis produced a charred fragment of a photograph. It showed McGovern and his mother. Where did this come from? A house in Woolsey Street. It was completely burnt out. B.C. Holton had to go down there just after he saw our suspect bought in. No? McGovern, the woman next door thinks. Just him and his mother. They'd not lived there long. Didn't see much of the neighbours. The mother's gone into hospital, apparently. We're checking that. I want to see everything on Copley, Barnes and Gear. And Jake Normington, too, for that matter. Has anybody got a hold of Normington yet? Your music friend. I'm still trying. I'm going to visit Mrs. McGovern in hospital. What about him? You keep Lewis. He's where he wants to be. In Parktown Hospital, Mrs. McGovern was asleep photograph of her son on the bedside table. The night nurse looked up as George Parsons approached the desk. Good evening. You've got a patient, Mrs. McGovern. Visiting's over, I'm afraid. I've got an important message from her son. He's not been, has he? Not since yesterday. She asked me for him. She does ask for him, yes. Do you mind if I sit and wait? 
The nurse got up, and Parsons followed her over to the bed. By this time, Morse and a female colleague were walking through the hospital towards the cancer ward. Parsons sat down beside the sick woman, who opened her eyes. Mrs. McGovern. I want you to give your son a message from his friends. Morse and the policewoman came into the ward. Police. Chief Inspector Morse, you had a patient, uh, Mrs. McGovern? Yes. She's got a visitor with her. Morse looked over at Parsons, who stood up. Could I have a word, sir? Parsons ran out of the ward and along the corridor. <laughs> Parsons ignored him. Further down the corridor, he grabbed a porter's trolley and threw it across Morse's path. Morse hurdled it and turned the corner, still only yards behind. Parsons found a staircase and clattered down it. Morse followed but lost sight of him around the bends in the stairs. Downstairs, the corridors were deserted. Morse turned one more corner to see nothing but an empty expanse of linoleum stretching in both directions. There was no sign of the burly figure of Parsons. No sound. Morse paused for a moment, his heart pumping. Then he noticed an open door and went towards it. It led into a storeroom in the basement, dimly lit, and another staircase. Morse crept down it, quietly, cautiously. He couldn't see Parsons on the balcony, creeping along behind a row of shelving. He peered down at Morse, directly below him now. Morse tried to stifle his breathing straining his eyes to see into the shadows. Who's paying your bills? Because there are few to be paid now. Intimidation with violence. Arson. Murder, maybe. Morse turned to see a door flapping open. He went over to it. Parsons had got clean away. There was an uncomfortable atmosphere in the master's lodge. The Copley Barneses, Imogen and her husband, and Sylvie Maxton were assembled in the drawing room. You must be quite exhausted, Matthew. A funeral, an arrest, imagine. <laughs> did you, did you find it difficult identifying the man? I didn't identify him. Not categorically. It wasn't possible. We're off then. Got a musical ride to see to tomorrow. Going to be busy with the crepe paper. You've made a terrific go of all that. The business, I mean. Oh, do you really think so? It's Ron mostly. He likes taking on Rex. Oh, no, Imogen, you've always done your share. I've been most impressed. You've accomplished a great deal since you had you. Since you changed course. Imogen's always been accomplished. Do you remember this? Oh, les jeux 
don't fall. Oh, yes, darling, do. Do you think you could? She never practices, I'm afraid. Nor do I. But this is second nature. Come on, Emma. Must we have this plunge into nostalgia? But there were such happy times, weren't there? Such harmony. Come on, Emma. Let's give them our turn. Terrified, Imogen looked at Garrett before sitting down at the piano with Sylvie. Imogen stopped and stood up. Oh, that was great. What's wrong? That's enough. Let's go home. Of course. You probably just forgot. One gets these tiresome blanks occasionally. Come on, Emma. It is time for your pills anyway. Ah, oh, yes. The jarring of Emma. <laughs> Bye, Father. Don't worry, everything will soon be back to normal. Yes, she is a bit jarring, isn't she? Whose fault is that? Won't well, you be more explicit? Since you appear to have been tempted out of your usual reticence. What exactly is this fault? Do you think all you have to worry about is the way I speak? Thank you. Well, luckily, I don't have a grating local accent these days. Oh, Sylvia, you have a beautiful speaking voice. Yeah. Well, we worked on it, didn't we, Blanche? Is your, what will one call it, your brief, your assignment almost complete? I fear my ego will never recover from all this attention. I suspect your ego is proof against most things, Master. I should be staying on a couple of extra days, as a matter of fact. I wonder if that would be convenient. Uh, oh, well, I'm in Oxford. Uh, not necessarily here. With Imogen, maybe. Is she up to visitors? Well, it might be better if you... I'll consult the diary. Yeah, I'm thinking of covering this gardening competition. If you really think Beaufort's going to win... Beaufort and the fabulous Phil. <laughs> Oh, we shall certainly win. I've taken the measure of the opposition. The visuals seem almost too good to miss. Shall I clear away? Mrs. Walsh might well choose to feel victimized in the morning if I don't. Copley Barnes ignored her. Matthew? The next morning, Jake Normington carried his suitcases out of the college to a waiting taxi and left. I have to get out, Morse. I'm leaving this cesspool. That's as far as my courage will take me. Not very far, you might think. But at least I'm not staying to be submerged like the rest of them. Go easy on Mick McGovern. Trust me. He's a neurotic but not a liar, and he'll talk when he can. Although you may be hard put to distinguish truth from conspiracy theory. I'm letting my fellowship go. I have to spend all my time with students who can't even begin to understand Oxford irony. They think it's hostile. Still, some of them love Renaissance music as much as you do. Lewis finished reading Normington's letter. What do you reckon? I reckon we may as well give up now. Morse drove them to a riverside pub for lunch. We all want to keep our jobs. We're not all engaged in a high-minded pursuit of the truth. We're not high-minded, perhaps. But we want to know, don't we? 
guess, Lewis, we have that in common. Policemen and academics, we want to know. The difference is that we'd be sacked for withholding information. Now, tell me how far you got looking into the college investments. Oh, nothing doing. I don't have the rank. Don't you, Lewis? I didn't go to Oxford, see? Well, I don't have the rank either. Why don't you ask Mr. Rennie? Perhaps he has the rank. I think there's a tie-up with McGovern. He's a systems analyst out of work. The DHSS have been pushing him. Well, there's hundreds of jobs in his field. He has a doctor's note for his nerves, though. And his last job was with Soil Scan in Gloucester. Soil Scan? Yeah. Agricultural chemicals and that. Fertilizers. A subsidiary of Corby International. Yeah, that's right. There, isn't it, Lewis? Hmm? Beaufort is involved with the parent company. It's right there and we can't get at it. So why bother to try? Everyone's happy, no one's been murdered. What was I doing running through a hospital after a, a hired heavy waste of effort? And you reckon Norman's got the tape? What do you think he'll do with it? Textual analysis for his American students, I expect. I could do a bit of work on soil scan. Have another look at the stuff from the fire. Have another look at my glass first. It's a bit early for a second, isn't it? Sir? We still haven't fathomed the umbrella. Nor the pool of vomit. What a good idea, Lewis. The sicked up quiche. Do fathom that. Why don't you? I'll see you later, then, sir. Lewis, his patience at an end, walked out of the pub, leaving Moore staring bitterly into his empty glass. At the master's lodge, the housekeeper signed for a parcel that came in the second post. Here you are. Thank you very much. Lunch came downstairs just as the housekeeper was putting the parcel on the hall table. She caught her breath. In spite of herself, she couldn't resist opening the parcel. It contained layer upon layer of tissue paper. You said an appointment at 12.30. When her husband had gone again, she pulled out a mass of green satin hair ribbon. Interest, dear sir. What is it? He held up the slide that Lewis had given him against the window. It's a printer's code from the bottom edge of a poster. What kind of a poster? Green piece, would you believe? You're certain? I couldn't be sure. Well, good work, Lewis. There was some other stuff like that around the house. A couple of books, magazines. I suppose most of the stuff would have been burnt, though, in his room. All right, that's McGovern. We know he's interested in ecological matters and he used to work for soil scan. Well, he could have been, what, blowing the whistle, couldn't he? It's possible. Well, why would he knock him down a blow that would have been on his side? Maybe he got the wrong man. He was it. He got the wrong man. It was dark, it was raining. Brilliant. But he had a bad stomach and all. McGovern, sensitive bloke like him. Yes, thank you, Lewis. And he'd have fetched up his ecological vegetarian supper off there just around the corner. Oh, sorry, sir. You reckon he was out to get the master? Or possibly he was out to get Corby International through the master. No, 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 no. That still doesn't. Morse. 
Chief Superintendent Rennie been informed? In that case, say we'll be there in a few minutes. We've had a call from Mrs. Copley Barnes. It seems we're off again. In the cancer ward at Parktown Hospital, a nurse led a policewoman to Mrs. McGovern's bedside. Mrs. McGovern. Mrs. McGovern. The woman's eyes fluttered open. In the stables, Imogen Garrett paced up and down like a robot. I'm sorry. I'm not in contact. Where is she? She's in the stable. Mm. Okay. What happened? Bad night. Somebody called her this morning. Imogen? Imogen? It's Mummy, darling. It's all right. I'm here now, Imogen. Unlock the door, darling, and, and come out, please. Imogen ignored her mother. At Beaufort College, Morse and Lewis arrived to find that Mrs. Copley Barnes had gone out. Lewis went outside to speak to Phil Hopkirk as Morse contemplated the green ribbon. Sylvie Maxton appeared. Not as off putting as a sheep's skull, I suppose. Dressed to the master like the last one. Has he seen her? No. Nope. Blanche would sooner he didn't. She doesn't want him bothered. We'll have to know if inquiries are to go on. Exactly. Her idea is that you just log it, or whatever it is you do, and then do nothing. Unless another real abomination arrives. I can't just log it. She made the complaint. She should be here to give details. That's what I said. She wasn't even going to call you. She asked my opinion. You insisted? You said you wanted to be informed. You don't think the master should be spared the bother? No, I don't. Why should he? You tell me. I'm sorry? Why the master shouldn't be protected. Are you suggesting your inquiries be compromised because he has to be told something he'd rather not know? No, I mean in larger terms. In terms, say, that uh, might affect the slant of this piece you're writing about him. I haven't decided on the slant yet. No? What's his record on, um, for example, environmental matters? As deplorable as some of his associates? David Naylor's, for instance? We shall have to see, shall we? My editor wants a series on men of power and influence. The master of Oxford College is an obvious choice. What do you make of his son-in-law? What? His son-in-law. He isn't an obvious choice for the master's daughter, is he? Ron. He's Imogen's little rebellion. <laughs> A different kind of rebellion from yours. I don't know what you mean. We have a file on you, Miss Maxton, at headquarters. Sylvie smiled winningly. At the stables, Blanche looked anxiously up at Garrett from the locked stable door. Are you listening? Are you listening, Mummy? Yes, yes, darling, I'm listening. You've got to get rid of her. You've got to get her away. Tell her to go. She's evil. Do you understand? I don't know what you're talking about, darling. We were getting on so well. It was like the old days. I grew up, that's all. I is into being Imogen's paid companion. Which is what I was, in effect. Blanche's second child. After school. Most weekends, every holiday. I was destined for an Oxford scholarship, but my mother became ill. And I discovered gin and tonic, and boys, and smashing the occasional shop window. I'm a good girl now, though. Promise. 
she turned to the piano. Morse opened a photograph album that was lying on top of it. The Copley Barnes years. Touching, aren't they? They say idyllic. They were, in a way. Only I didn't get the best out of them. Rather like learning this. For the fingering. And not knowing till much later what it meant. Morse studied the photographs of Sylvie and Imogen. They must have been about 10 or 11 when they were taken. Two little girls on the beach, laughing and playing. As Sylvie played the piano, the music floated out into the garden to where Phil Hopkirk was working. He looked round and suddenly ran towards the French windows. I'm sorry, I, I thought you were someone else. There's been a message, sir. It's urgent. What is it? From the hospital. My government's mother. She's dying. Tell him to get him out there fast. With an escort. Morse followed Lewis out, and Sylvie got up and stared out into the garden. Something was bothering her. Something was bothering her very much indeed. Morse and Lewis raced to the hospital. When they got there, Mrs. McGovern was dead. Coven sat on the edge of the bed, hugging himself. I'm sorry, Mr. McGovern. Now I'll tell you. It was 1987. I'd worked for Soil Scan about a year. They'd been testing this stuff known as EK4 over, well, I don't remember, maybe, well, say since the beginning of the 80s, on a few targeted farms in Norfolk. And they realized they'd got a winner. There'd never been a fertilizer like it. High crop yields, clean soil, everything. There were mammals flying around predicting the end of third world famine by the turn of the century. There was government money, government approval. You handled them, the memos? Well, they were common knowledge. You see, I dealt with the figures from the tests, and you couldn't argue with them. And then it all started to go wrong. That same afternoon, Copley Barnes and his wife confronted Sylvie on the stairs. We are so very sorry. My instinct last night was quite right. I was mistaken, Sylvia. I don't know what got into my head. We have guests arriving. Do you see our Very four? distinguished guest. I thought I was a distinguished guest. So, I'm afraid we need your room. I I'm don't apologize. I was leaving anyway. Had you thought of going to Imogen? I fear she couldn't cope. I I'll be at the Randolph. Two nights. It's not the first time I've fallen out of favor, is it, Blanche? Fallen <laughs> out? What on earth do you mean? There's no question. Um, I must go into second thoughts about this newspaper venture. It was, after all, my wife's idea. Too bad, Master. I shall write my observations with or without your approval. And it's Sylvie, Blanche. Not Sylvia. Sylvie was what my mother called me. It's the name I write under. It's Sylvie now. Sylvia was there. Sylvia Blanche's face. Cancer. 
Yes, cancer. It showed up first in cattle that grazed adjacent fields, got cereal in their feet. Then there was the stuff about people. What stuff? There were two bread chains, bakeries that used flour from treated wheat. It was the last stage of the trials. Soil scan were about to go public. Then some bright GP started asking questions about the local incidents of brain tumors in children. Your mother had cancer. She just died, for Christ's sake. You were obsessed with cancer, McGovern. Yeah, sure. If you mean I didn't want anyone else suffering like she did. At least not without some accountability. It happens all the time. A mistake, people suffer. I'm not saying it was deliberate. But it happened. And nobody would admit it. So you told Julian Deer? Well, I'd read his books. He was... Well, you know, you'd read his books too, Jake said. No mind, Jake. So you gave Dr. Deere information you'd handled in the computer department. And other stuff. Stuff I photocopied when I saw what was going on. Then I left soil scan. I got the shakes a bit. So why did you hit Deere in Beaufort Path? I didn't. I keep telling you, he'd been hit when I got there. Chief Superintendent Rennie would like to see you, sir. Well, doesn't he know I'm interviewing? Right away, he said. Morse picked up his jacket and left. Meanwhile, Blanche was out shopping on her bicycle when she noticed Phil Hopkirk's small daughter, Amanda, sitting in a parked car. She got off her bike and came over. Hello, Amanda. I thought you were in London. Are you back for a few days? We must have a lesson. I found that little Mendelssohn piece I'd like you to try. Oh, Phil, I wish you told me Amanda was going to be home. I do hope she's managed to keep up her practice. She's so very talented, you know. Hopkirk got in the car without speaking. Well, goodbye, Amanda. Goodbye. Blanche stared after the car, hurt and puzzled. In the police station, Morse was talking to Rennie. No, well, I take your point, Morse. Indeed, I take all of your points. I believe McGovern's stories. Yes, well, maybe you do, but... When I have time, I'll go through the books and I'll identify the man that gave me the slip in the hospital. Look, you will have a chance to do McGovern a bit of good in the witness box. First he'll get bail, then he'll get off. You see to it that there's reasonable doubt. Beaufort College has very large interests and shareholdings in Corby International and its subsidiary companies. You don't know the size of their whole I case. don't know precisely, sir, because they're storming. I do know there's a Corby representative among the college's advisors. Well, there's nothing unusual in that these days, with business subsidizing the universities. No, no, Morse. You stay out of Beaufort. I'm sorry. We're not talking about big-time crime, for God's sake. We're talking about a cover-up. A cover-up of scientific data that my stuff, the fertilizer, whatever it is, has been withdrawn. Even McGovern says so. If new evidence comes to light, the right department will deal with it. It's not for us. If McGovern is telling the truth, Dr. Tears attacker is walking around free. You don't find it strange, sir, that the Master sent Dr. Deer ahead of him into Beaufort Pass? What an extraordinary imagination you have, Mark. Maybe you should give it a rest. Yeah, why don't you take that holiday soon? You'll have some leave, will you? Rennie put on his glasses and returned to his paperwork. Morse left the room with the travel brochure Rennie had given him. You're getting off, McGovern, in a manner of speaking.
her way to the Randolph Hotel, Sylvie Maxton drove up and parked outside the gardener's cottage. As she approached the front door, she saw Amanda looking out of the window. Popkirk opened the door and she went inside without speaking. In another part of Oxford, McGovern was walking from the police station when Morse's red Jaguar drew up beside him and the door opened. Get in. What? Get in and keep down. McGovern got inside and lay down. I'm putting my job on the line over this, McGovern. I want the whole story. After her encounter in Oxford, Blanche cycled out to the stables and went upstairs to the house. Garrett watched her go in, but didn't try to stop her. Imogen turned away from the window and sat down. Her mother came in and sighed deeply. She took the green ribbon out of her bag and showed it to Imogen with reproach in her eyes. At night, Morse received a phone call from America. There is nothing new about the soil scan there. It follows a familiar pattern. Life is destroyed, and no one admits responsibility. We fail in our own responsibility if we don't do everything in our power to see that such incidents are made known, are held up to the light of day, are discussed and made the basis of a sterner policy. It might have helped if I'd heard this before, Jake. Sorry, I have to keep my career out of the dirt. I could do you for obstruction. You want me to send you the tape? No, don't bother. I don't think anyone will want to hear it somehow. Give me my regards, Willie Morse. Say there could be a job for him here. Yeah. Morse switched off the phone and walked over to McGovern. Julian told me to go to him if things got rough. He said we'd get on. Is that what you'll do? Join him? I will, if I survive. Let's not get melodramatic. Who's being melodramatic? Who burned my house down? Who had you taken off the case, Inspector Morse? Someone who could say words in high places. Someone who's damned if he let your lot see the extent of the college's investment in Corby. No one is going to kill you. You're not important enough. What did they have on you? What were they going to tell your mother? I did some posing for magazines. Years ago. I was broke. Hard stuff, you mean? She wouldn't have understood. I mean, she knew about me, but that kind of thing. I didn't want her to die with it on her mind. You were supposed to confront Julian Deere and tell him you'd given him false information about Soil Scan because you had a grudge against them for not promoting you. Yes. Only someone had got through him first. Well, I thought I was being set up for a murder. When Copley Barnes appeared, I clouted him and ran. Tell me, what did you hope to achieve with the parcels? Parcels? The ecological statements in the post to the master. The um, dried snake skin, was it? The uh, sheep's head and the blood, the green ribbon. The what? Me? No, not you, obviously. Someone else. McGovern left the house. At that moment, Lewis was struggling to the phone in a crowded pub. He went past a blackboard advertising the day's specials. 
including something called two cheese quiche. Morse lay on his sofa listening to the piano piece that Sylvie Maxton had played that day. The travel brochure was on the floor beside him. He sighed when the phone rang, but stretched out his hand to answer it. Morse. I hope you'll let me finish this, sir, because it'll probably get you mad. What is it, Lewis? I'm in this pub, sir. I've been checking pubs off my own bat. And they've got this speciality quiche on the menu. Cheese. Green dolce lava, as it happens. Lewis. No, listen, sir. You know who's a regular here? Phil Hopkirk, the gardener. Barman says he was in here early the night that Dr. Deer got attacked. Getting a real skinful. What do you want to do, Lewis? We're off the case. Well, I could go and see him in the morning, sir. But on your own initiative, against orders. I'm just curious, sir. I mean, it was me that got the vomit analyzed. Do it if it'll get it out of your system. Morse sat up and glanced at the travel brochure and started to look through it again. Something made him pause. All the photographs of little children. Little girls on the beach with plastic buckets, their hair tied up in ribbons. First thing next morning, Morse got in his car and drove out to the garret stables. Before he got there, Imogen came outside and walked up to Garrett. Can I have the keys? Sure? Yes, I'm sure. Drive safe. She got in the car and drove off. At Hopkirk's cottage, Lewis was making faces through the window at Amanda. Inside, the little girl shrank awkwardly into a chair. I want to see your daddy! The door opened, and a woman looked out. Uh, Detective Sergeant Lewis, Thames Valley Police. Why is it about her not being at school? I don't know anything about it, I'm afraid. I, I just do a bit of housekeeping. No, I came to see her dad. I told him we shouldn't keep her off. Where is Mr. Hopkins? Oh, he left early, some competition or other. Is that his umbrella? If I take a look. Lewis stepped inside as Morse drove up outside the stables. Garrett came out of the tack room. I'd like to speak to your wife, Mr. Garrett. She's not here. Where is she? She's at the Randolph, seeing Sylvie. When did she leave? About 20 minutes ago. Morse ran back to his car, leaving Garrett looking puzzled. At the college, Phil Hopkirk strode through the garden with a spade, his jaw set. Morse didn't find Sylvia or Imogen at the Randolph Hotel and left again in a hurry. Some 
some students were larking about in the grounds, one of them spraying his companions with champagne, as Hopkirk, the spade over his shoulder, walked past them, his eyes fixed on some point straight ahead. Morse arrived at the master's lodge. Mr. Paxton! In Beaufort Quad, Hopkirk strode up to the central display of flowers and stopped. Gray, the porter, came out of the lodge behind him. Morse let himself into the sitting room and opened the photograph album that lay on the piano. He stopped at a photograph of the two girls on the beach, with a half-buried dried snakeskin in the foreground. In another, there was a sheep skull in the sand. And in several, Sylvie was wearing a green satin ribbon in her hair. Morse walked into the dining room and looked at the writing desk. Then something made him turn round. At the table, Copley Barnes lay with his head on the tablecloth. Morse noticed the bloody wound on the back of the master's head and turned away sickened. He had it coming. Someone had to do it sometime. Morse picked up the phone and dialed. I would have called you. I was going to call you. Morse, who is that? Find them. Time to come to Beaufort College, the Master's Lodge, as soon as you can. Thanks. Where's Mrs. Copley Barnes? Friday. It'll be organ practice in the chapel. Same old routine, year in, year out. Tell me about the holidays at the seaside. Kind of them to invite me. What did you find on the beach? A starfish? A snake? Or was there a sheep's head? Trust me to spoil it. How did you spoil it, Sylvie? There was a snake on the rock. I screamed. I made him put his arms around me. You were frightened you were just a little girl. No. I was a big girl. I was 11. I was a flirt. Is that what he told you? Buried in the sand, something with horns and holes for the eyes. I looked at it, I just I just kept looking at it. I, I looked at it the whole time. I, I, I didn't look at him once. She buried her head in her hands. The, uh, the green ribbon. Outside. Hopkirk took his spade like an axe and swung it into his plant. I left a green ribbon in his bed once. Imogen found it. She... I don't think she knew what it meant. She couldn't have, could she? Not his own daughter. 
At that moment, Imogen walked into the chapel where Blanche had been playing the organ. Why did you send the parcels? I wanted him to remember. All the times he'd made me be nice to him. Cupboards. Bathrooms. In here once. Hopkirk destroyed the display. And Mandy Hopkirk? Oh, have you seen her? She's so sweet, so clean. Poor Phil, I could have helped him. We had a case. Why couldn't he wait? The flowers and plants were hurled to the ground, scattering earth and shards of pots everywhere. Where's Mrs. Copley Barnes? Morse and Lewis headed for the chapel just as Imogen was walking down the aisle. The choir were practicing and she noticed nothing out of the ordinary. Then she spun round. Above the door, high on top of the organ, Blanche appeared. Morse and Lewis walked in and stopped. I told him, Imogen. I told him this morning. I said we talked. You and I. You'd better bring my father. Your father's dead, Mrs. Garrett. I couldn't allow him to live, do you see? He didn't deserve it, and neither do I. There was a serpent in our house, coiled around the foundations. Imogen slid to the floor and started to rock back and forth. Mother! Mother, stay with me, please. I can't, darling. There's the dignity of the college to consider as well, you see. There's never only one bad parent. The other must be bad, too, if only by default. It's my fault. I knew about it. I knew all about them. That's why he didn't like me. I should have said. It's my no, fault. No. no, no, darling. I'm the one to blame. I let it go on. I could have saved Amanda. I have to die. It's not a matter of guilt, is it? It's a matter of responsibility. There are two women with their lives disfigured. Now a young girl. How many others? There's only one way to help. Let it all come out. Nothing hushed up this time. You have to live. You have no choice. Lewis climbed up to the top of the organ and stood behind Blanche, not daring to move nearer. She seemed to be frozen. Would you sing, please? Do you mind, Chief Inspector? Music does put heart into one, don't you agree? Morse nodded at the choir. Morse bent down beside the stricken Imogen and helped her up. Blanche allowed Lewis to take her by the arm and he led her outside to a police car. was taken away. When Morse brought Imogen outside, Garrett folded her protectively in his arms and took her to his car. 
As for Phil Hopkirk, he sat impassively amid the ruins of his beautiful flowers and waited for the police to take him away. Man gets drunk, takes out blindly at someone he thinks is the master, finds he's killed Dr. Deer instead. Why couldn't he come to us about his kid? But he owned him. He had no power. He didn't belong to the club. There's not a soul would have believed him. Serpent. Was that it? Did a bit of curling round here and all. The infernal serpent. He it was whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind. Milton, Lewis, Paradise Lost.